Well, as you've already heard this evening, we're going to be continuing a theme that we were looking at this morning, and that is marriage. Uh, we weren't looking particularly at marriage, but the fact that Jesus attended a marriage and that he honored it by his presence uh, and, of course, by helping out the celebration when the uh, wine ran out. Uh, our Lord was willing to create some new wine, uh, not that he might help those who were drunk get into a deeper stupor, as it were, but rather to, um, uh, to promote what was going on, that celebration, as we saw this morning, nobody there was getting drunk, otherwise Jesus would not have provided the wine. It's not a sin to drink, but it is a sin to get drunk. But let's this evening focus on the marriage itself and why it is that our Lord honored that marriage, what um, he, of course, wants us to see in marriage because he actually uses that um, institution, which, of course, he is, as God, uh, instituted from the very beginning to be a picture of his relationship with the church. Uh, that is to be the paradigm, the pattern that we are to model our marriages after. And of course, in the future, if we are seeking to be married, we wanna make sure that we marry somebody with whom we will be able to show that picture to others. And as Christians, of course, we can only do that if we marry other believers and if we marry those that are mature and seek to be mature ourselves. But let's, uh, let's begin by looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Very familiar passage, verses 22 through 33, where Paul tells us that we ought to model our marriages after the relationship that Jesus has with his church, the relationship he has with us. This is what we read. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and, be, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Uh, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening, and you'll, you'll recognize, of course, that I've, I've bitten off a, a big chunk, so we're not going to be able to look at everything, but I hopefully will hit the major points, the things that we need to hear this evening. Now, I've already mentioned that we're following up on what we saw this morning uh, with regard to marriage. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were invited to share in a celebration a celebration of a man and a woman making a lifelong covenant, basically an agreement to be man and wife until death parts them. On this occasion, we saw Jesus even supplied the wine that was necessary when that which had already been provided ran out uh, to show us his glory, because only God can turn water into wine, but also to show his approval uh, on this event. And I think it's also timely for us to review this subject, because I don't think we've actually looked at marriage for quite a while, in light of the distortions that we see today that are passing as marriage. Obviously, not everything that is called marriage is necessarily marriage. God is the one who created it, and God alone has the right to tell us what it is. So I'd like for us to spend a few moments this evening looking at marriage, what marriage is, uh, who may or who must marry, and 
how marriage is to reflect that relationship that the Lord has uh, with His church. His relationship is the model. It is the paradigm that we are to follow. So first of all, what is marriage? I've already said, you know, that marriage is, is a covenant. A covenant is basically an agreement, in this case, between a man and a woman to live together as husband and wife for the entirety of their lives. It is what has been called a covenant of companionship, an agreement to provide mutual love and support throughout life until death parts you. Now we read about its beginnings in Genesis chapter 2. We read that after God created everything, all the creatures, after he had planted the Garden of Eden, after he had placed Adam in the garden to take care of it, basically to cultivate it and to guard it from any intruders, after he had given him the freedom to eat of all the trees but one tree, and of course that tree to see if he was willing to obey him, uh, God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now it is interesting that the Lord had given Adam the, the task of naming all of these new creatures that God had just created. And as Adam went out to, to name them, he noted that every, every uh, one of these creatures, every male had a corresponding creature or a female. But he noted there was nothing like that for him. So we read in Genesis 2, verses 21 through 24, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now again, I want us to look at uh, the situation in which the Lord created this uh, woman and what it is he created her for. I want you to notice in, in verse 18 again, Genesis 2 verse 18, what God said. It is not good for the man to be alone. Now we understand from our own experience that God has made us to be social creatures. Uh, we need to be around other people. We need interaction. People go crazy when they are in absolute solitude. And most of us, not all of us, as we'll see in just a little bit, but most of us need someone to interact with at a very close level. Marriage is the covenant that God has instituted that provides that kind of companionship. I want you to note secondly what God says in Genesis 2.18. He says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper. Somebody who could come alongside the man, somebody who would be able to help him and one that he would be able to help in the work that the Lord had given them both to do. Now we read what that work is in Genesis 1:28. After he had created the man and the woman, he said, or actually we read, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And I want you to notice thirdly, and again in Genesis 2.18, what this helper would be like and what this helper had to be like in order for him to have the help he needed to do what God called him to do. He says, I will make him a helper suitable for him. Basically, he's saying that she would correspond to him, would be like him, as the animals were like one another only made to help him carry out, uh, well, back, actually all facets of what God had commanded, but one in particular, she had to be a female in order that they could be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, even as the animals were made male and female so that they could do the same. A simple overview of human anatomy shows us that it takes a male and a female in order to 
procreate. Now, in instituting, I want you to notice you know, this in particular, in instituting marriage between one man and one woman, the Lord was not telling us that men may not have friends who are men, that they may not care about them, that they may not love them deeply, as David and Jonathan had a very special relationship. It reminds us of that very thing. They were the closest of friends. They loved one another as they loved their own souls. Nor was the Lord saying that one woman may not love another one in the sense of having them as a very closest of friends. But he was saying and continues to tell us today that a man may not treat another man as a man treats a woman. And a woman must also not do the same with regard to another woman. And let me just remind you of passages of Scripture where the Lord is quite plain on this matter so that we don't get distorted. You know, society affects us too, doesn't it? We live around these people and we are susceptible to that influence. We need to remember what God says about this so that we don't fall into this trap of thinking that somehow it's okay. It isn't okay. The Lord says to Moses in Leviticus 20 verse 13, if there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. I want you to notice that everywhere where the Lord speaks about this kind of a relationship, he, he does point out, or I should say he doesn't make a distinction between those who may be born such and those who choose to do such because there is no such distinction. We're going to see in a moment that this is always a choice. Paul tells it, and let me just point out this as well in Leviticus 20 verse 13, look at what God says is, is the penalty that this sin deserves. By the way, all sin deserves death, but there are some sins that, as it were, are worse than others even so. And this one, the Lord does single out, is particularly serious. Paul tells us that such a relationship is th as this is the result of God's handing men over to judgment for their sin of rejecting him. Without reading everything that Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, I would like to read verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. This is the result of those who know God exists, rejecting God and worshiping the creature rather than the creator. God gives them over to degrading passions. They exchange the natural function for that which he says is unnatural. Why is it unnatural? Because we've already saw at the beginning, God made them male and female and instituted marriage so that there would be that relationship in which to raise children, that they might multiply and fill the earth the natural thing is the man and a woman alone can do that. And Paul tells us that if those who commit this sin don't repent and turn to Christ, it's clear they will never see heaven. By the way, that's true of any sin. And we'll see the list that Paul gives as he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 10. And I'm quoting this particular passage because it's quite clear that homosexuality is included? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He says, don't be deceived. Don't think you can practice these sins or any sin and still inherit the kingdom of heaven. You must repent of every sin. If you don't repent of every sin, you are not a believer and you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, by implication, Paul is telling us, if you truly love the Lord Jesus, you will have regard for his entire word 
and you will turn from every sin and seek to do what is right. He's not saying you won't lapse into sin. He's not saying you won't fall, stumble and fall many times. But your, uh, your nature, your heart will be to obey. That's what you'll want and that will be the pattern of your life. Now I do want you to notice from 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 10 that God holds those who commit these sins accountable for committing these sins. But we know from the justice of God that he's only going to hold people accountable for the things that they choose to do, not for things over which we have no choice. I mean, God doesn't command us really to do things that um, we can't do. I need to say that in a guarded way because uh, we realize we can't obey God perfectly, but it's our own fault that we can't do that. He made us originally so that we could, and it's our fault that we fell into the situation that we're in. But God doesn't make a person a certain way and, as it were, make them so they have no choice and then punish them for making the choice that they must make, as it were, because he made them that way. God would not be just in so doing. It is a choice. And that's why the Lord holds them accountable. It's, it's a choice like every other sin that a person commits. Yes, it's true, we're born into the world with a desire for sin, and some of us have desires for others, you know, sins, some sins rather than other sins, that's true. But we're still accountable for choosing that which is against God's will, and that's why God holds us accountable for those choices in this sin as well as any other. But I want you to recognize too that since it is a choice, it's something that one may also choose to turn away from to the Lord Jesus Christ and be cleansed. Now that wouldn't be, we do know that, God, that people need God's grace in order to do that. But God doesn't have to, as it were, force them against their nature to do that. He just simply overcomes the sinful heart and then when they choose what is right, they will choose what God actually instituted in the beginning. Paul continues in, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, such were some of you but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You see, the Lord is able to give the power to overcome that sin and every other sin. And that's exactly what he does for his people when he grants them the grace to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is something we need to remember. If the Lord should give us the opportunity to minister to somebody who is actually caught up in this sin, they can be delivered from it. Just like the adulterer can be delivered from his adultery or the murderer from his murdering or the, the drunkard from his drinking or the thief from his stealing, the Lord is able to deliver to the uttermost if he wills to do so and he does it through the gospel. So there is no one outside of his reach except of course those who've committed the unpardonable sin but that is a very serious and extreme sin and we shouldn't necessarily assume that anyone has committed that. We should try to evangelize them. Now getting back again to uh, marriage, as I said, it, it is a, a covenant of companionship. It is a covenant that God makes uh, between the man and the woman that, that he made. It's not good for the man to be alone. The Lord made a helper for him, one that corresponds to him. We also need to see that marriage is something that God instituted to be a lifelong covenant. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6 in his answers to the Pharisees when they asked him, uh, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? He said this, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now again, this was God's will for marriage. When you enter into this covenant, he intends that you both continue in this covenant through the rest of your life. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't circumstances that end a marriage and that allow one to contract a new marriage. There are two grounds in Scripture. Jesus spoke of unrepentant adultery as one of them, and Paul speaks of desertion 
as another. The Lord doesn't intend for us to remain bound to somebody who's intent on breaking that covenant, but that gives us the grounds to be released from that covenant. But that, again, is an entirely different subject. I, didn't want to, I just wanted to say we understand that unless those grounds exist, the Lord intends for us to remain in that covenant, in that agreement, husband and wife for life. Now, marriage is a lifelong covenant. Marriage is instituted by God between one man and one woman to provide mutual help and companionship and the work that he has given us to do to fill the earth and to subdue it. By the way, everything we do really has to do with the subjection of the earth. And we don't have time to get into that, but that's the cultural mandate. That's part of the work God has given to us, why he put us into the world. But the main thing we are to do as redeemed people, of course, is to build the kingdom of God, as well as continue to do the work he has given to us to uh, subdue the earth and to make it yield, as it were, its, its, well, its, its usefulness to mankind. Um, anything other than this is not marriage. Regardless of what society chooses to call it, it is not marriage. God tells us what marriage is. That's what it is, nothing else. Man doesn't have the authority to change what God has ordained. Okay, so that's what marriage is. But secondly, let's ask the question, who should marry? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, marriage is something that most of us need, but not all of us. All of us need social interaction at one level or another. All of us are social creatures, but there are, of course, ways of meeting that need outside of marriage in the body of Christ, that interaction that we need. Uh, not all of us need a, a, as close a relationship as marriage, so we want to ask the question, well, who does need it and who doesn't need it? Well, Paul answers that question for us in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 through 9. He says, first of all, there are those who must marry. They really don't have a choice. This is God's solution to a particular um, problem that they may have. Paul writes this, beginning in verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I, Paul was single, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul says, because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, each woman is to have her own husband. He says, if you don't have self-control, if you're not able to completely control your desires, and particularly your actions, if you cannot be in a single state without constantly being tempted to fall into fornication, sexual sin, then you need to marry. Now, you don't get married just for that reason, of course, but God instituted it to supply what is needed for those who have this particular struggle. If that is the situation you're in and you're not married, then you need to seek a wife. We're going to see there are other qualifications besides, of course, the ability to fulfill that particular desire. But Paul also recognizes from what we've read that there are those who don't need to marry who have a gift to remain single, a gift that not everybody has. Uh, by the way, those who have this gift have a choice. They may either marry or not marry. They may either, uh, again, uh, enter into this covenant or remain single. Now, why would anybody who has this gift want to remain single? It is 
that they might better serve the Lord. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 6 and 8, again, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this matter and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. And again, for what purpose? Why remain single when you could get married and have that relationship? Well, you might not want to, as I mentioned before, so that you may devote yourself more fully to the Lord's work. Well, who would want to do that? Well, every Christian, right? Who would want to serve the Lord? I mean, have you ever find yourself in a single state asking your question? Well, I don't have this gift, so I know this isn't for me. But sometimes it's because the Lord hasn't taken hold of our hearts yet the way that, that He may and the way that He desires that our hearts be given to Him. And we really don't see the, the, how important it is that we actually do serve Him. But that is why we're here. That's why He made us. That's why He redeemed us, that we might. So listen to what Paul says in verses 32 through 35 of 1 Corinthians 7. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. The one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Now, is Paul saying that it's better to be in an unmarried state? Certainly, that's what he's saying in this text. Was it just because of the situation they were in? Well, that had something to do with it. But I want you to notice there are things in that text that, that go beyond that situation and apply even to today. Is it true that a person who isn't married can devote themselves more fully to the Lord because their interests aren't divided? That's absolutely true. But for the person who doesn't have the gift of being content without being married, he has no hope of serving the Lord until he finally does get married, which is why he needs to or she needs to get married. If, if they don't have or if you don't have this gift, that's what you need to do. But let me just mention one more thing that Paul says. If you marry, whether you have this gift or you don't have this gift, the Lord says you must marry a Christian. You must marry a believer if you are a believer. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians 7, at the very end of the chapter in verse 39, Paul writes this, A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. Again, marriage is lifelong. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Christians are to marry other Christians. And he writes again to the Corinthians in his second letter, something which is perhaps even more forthright. You can get more forthright than that. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. He says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, could he be any clearer than this? If you're a Christian, how can you bind yourself together with an unbeliever in the closest of relationships? As a matter of fact, he tells us not to have close relationships with people who aren't Christians. If we are Christians, we are to reach out to them and try to evangelize them and bring them to Christ, but, but we can't get really close to them because if we do, bad company corrupts good morals. And really, we should find that we have very little in common with them uh, because 
we're light and they're darkness. We worship God and they worship the world. We should be as different as two things can possibly be. Now, Paul, of course, says this for another reason as well, and that's what we see in the last point. It's because of what our marriages are to reflect, what it is they are to be patterned after. Well, what is the pattern for our marriage? What is it that we are to uh, uh, model it after? Well, it's after that relationship of Christ and the church. God has instituted marriage to be a covenant of companionship, but that isn't its only purpose. He also means for it to be a picture of the relationship that we, as the bride of Christ, have with Jesus, who is our bridegroom. And that's what Paul tells us in our passage. Now with that in mind, let's consider what it is that husbands are to do in this relationship. And by the way, young ladies who are thinking about getting married someday, think about what kind of husband could actually do this, could actually fulfill what God says husbands are to do. An unbeliever is not going to be able to do this. But this is exactly what the Lord desires. Well, first of all, in Ephesians 5, 25 through 30, I thought if we started with what the husbands are to do, then when we get around to what the wives are to do, it'll be a bit more palatable when they see how their husbands are supposed to be treating them. Well, Paul writes this, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church. Now, as Jesus loves us, you see, that is how we are to love our wives. Do you like the way that Jesus loves you? Well, then what, what wife could possibly object to that if we act like Christ in our marriage and love our wives in the same way that Jesus loves his wife? in the same way he loves us. Now this is a very tall order. This is beyond our natural ability. I mean, husbands, you are to love your wife as Christ loves the church, or as he loves his own wife, as he loves his own bride, because that's what the church is, the bride of Christ. How much does Jesus love his wife? How much does he love you? He loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. His goal was to sanctify you to make you holy by his blood and through his word. That's the example that we're to follow. And so you husbands are to love your wife. In the same way, you are to lay down your life for her. Your goal must be to help her be as holy as she can possibly be in the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the Lord gives you authority. He gives you headship over your wife so that you may use that authority the way Jesus used it in his church. Not to lord it over your wife, not to force her to do things, to be your servant, but to be a servant to her, a servant leader, to minister to her, to help her to be all that she can be in Christ. And by the way, that is true in every area of your relationship. Husbands, you are to be as Jesus would be towards your wife. Now again, think about this, this husband, this is, this is what we're called to be. It's a very difficult thing, but something that the Lord gives us the ability uh, to do by his Holy Spirit. But again, young ladies here, this is the kind of husband you need to be looking for, the kind that is going to do this for you, the kind that's going to love you in this way. Is that right? That's right. Now if husbands love their wives in this way, this is going to make what wives are to do a whole lot easier. As for you wives or future wives, Paul writes this in verses 22 through 24, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. 
But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. By the way, I want you to recognize that we're all of us who are members of the body of Christ, we're already under the authority of Christ. We're already subjecting ourselves to this. Now, wives, if your husbands actually love you in the way that Jesus calls, you, or calls them to love you, it shouldn't be any more difficult to submit to them than it is to Jesus. Again, remember, Jesus does not give this authority to your husbands in order to lord it over you, but to love you, to minister to you, to lead you in his ways. And as your husband does this, you are to submit to his leadership. You are to follow him as he follows Jesus Christ. Now what if he tries to lead you in a way that is clearly not the way that Jesus would have you to go? Well, then you must respectfully not follow him. You have to obey God rather than men. But if he doesn't violate what the Lord says, even if his choice or his decision appears not to be the best, after you've discussed the matter thoroughly and tried to come to an agreement, you do have to let him have the final word, the final choice. And he will bear the responsibility and the con for the consequences of that particular choice, whether it's a good choice or a bad choice. Now, even as the husbands loving their wives as Christ loves the church makes their job of submission easier, the wives submitting to their husbands makes their work also easier. When we do what the Lord calls us to do, it makes it easier for both of us. But now here's something that, that we don't often think about, and that is, wives, when you submit to your husband as to the Lord, and when you, husbands, love your wives, as, or your wife, as Christ loved the church, you provide another witness to the world of the truth of Christianity. Now, I'm not saying they're necessarily going to receive it, but there is a testimony in that to the world, even as Jesus said, when we love one another, we, we prove to the world that Jesus is real, that he is alive, that we are his disciples. Well, this is just one other aspect of loving one another, isn't it? Doing what the Lord calls us to do. We become a picture of Christ and his church. And as we present that picture to the world, God's going to hold them accountable for that. But let me also note one other thing. When you disobey this command, when you husbands fail to love your wife, when you wives fail to submit to your husband, you give to the world another excuse to reject Christianity. That's, that's what happens when we disobey the Lord, when we do not reflect his glory in the way that we're supposed to. We give people an excuse not to believe. And realizing that the gospel is the only way of salvation, and the only way that people can avoid hell, we need to make sure that we do everything in our power to present the right kind of witness to them. And so for those of us to conclude who are married here this evening, let's strive to honor Jesus in our marriages and present to the world the witness that the Lord calls us to give to them. And for those of you who are not married, you need to think about a few things. First of all, determine whether you must marry or whether you just may marry. And if you must, or if you just choose to do so, make sure that you only marry one who is in the Lord. Marry a Christian. Make sure you marry somebody who is suitable. And I, by suitable, I mean not just, of course, one who is the opposite gender, so that you can you know, multiply and fill the earth and so forth, but somebody who will actually complement you. Somebody who has perhaps the same goals that you have, the particular calling that you have. Make sure you marry somebody who is suitable, who will be able to help you. Do what the Lord calls you to do. Somebody that you'll be able to raise children with to God's glory. And somebody with whom you may show the world a witness of Jesus' relationship to his bride, the church which means marry a mature believer, somebody who is devoted to Jesus Christ, because if you don't, you will not be able to do what the Lord calls you to do. Well, again, may the Lord give us grace to do what he calls us to do this evening. Let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask him to um, take 
these words and apply them uh, that we might benefit from them.